We can extend the tools that we've developed for dealing with equilibria of concentrations to deal with equilibria of pressures. This is actually fairly straightforward. We're just going to invoke the ideal gas equation, which has PV equals nRT. Now, if we solve this for N over V, and N is in moles and V is in liters, well, moles over liters, that's molarity, that's concentration. And N over V is equal to P over RT, according to this ideal gas expression. Well, now we can make a straightforward substitution. Wherever we see a concentration, we can replace it with what, a P over RT term. And so we replace all these concentrations in our equilibrium constant with the pressures over the RTs to the rate raised to the power of their stoichiometric coefficients. And just a reminder, as always, at equilibrium, we've waited a really long time. So these are all the final concentrations. And what we can do is we can collect all of these pressure terms together and all of these RT terms together. And once we have all the pressure terms collected together, so the pressure of C to the power of C, pressure of D to the power of D, pressure of A to the power of A, pressure of B to the power of B, or those powers are the stoichiometric coefficients. We're just gonna call this its own new constant, Kp. And then the RTs, uh, note here that in the numerator, right, we divide by RT, and that's raised to the power of C. So that's gonna give it a negative power. We're, we're dividing by RT C times instead of multiplying by it. And in the denominator, we divide by RT once, but then since it's also the denominator of the total equilibrium expression, we divide by it a second time, which flips it up in the numerator. So that's why we have positive A and B here, negative C and D. And so our expression, if we substitute Kp for all these pressure terms is Kc is equal to Kp times Rt to the A plus B minus C minus D, where this is what Kp means. Now note here that since Kp refers to gases, that if we have something that's not a gas, it's not going to appear in our Kp expression. So these coefficients here are gonna be equal to zero whenever we have a liquid or a solid or, or something aqueous there. Now note that we're gonna do the same thing we did with Kc, i.e. we want to have a dimensionless constant because we have to stick it into logarithms and whatnot. And so what we do surreptitiously is we actually take all these pressures we get and divide them by a reference pressure of one atmosphere. So our units of Kp are that it's dimensionless. We've secretly canceled all of those units out. But normally I won't write the expression this way just because it's extra work. Usually we'll just stick the pressures in and just drop the units as we go along. So as an example, let's say we have this reaction here where solid carbon reacts with water vapor to produce carbon monoxide and H2 gas. We have an equilibrium constant of 2.8 times 10 to the minus two at the temperature this reaction is performed at of 900 degrees Celsius. And in our vessel that we have, we'll inject four atmospheres of water vapor. And now our question is, if we wait a really long time, what's gonna be the final pressure of the water vapor? Well, the first thing we need is we need to know the equilibrium constant for pressures here, since we, we wanna do our final calculation in terms of pressure. So we'll use the expression we developed, Kc is equal to Kp times Rt raised to the power of all the coefficients in the expression. And remember that if we have something that's not a gas, we're gonna set that as being zero. So now if we solve for Kp, so I take this whole term and divide it over onto the Kc side, that will change the signs of all these coefficients. And now just plugging in the values we have, we're gonna to wanna to use the version of R that has liters and atmospheres in it. Um, we have our equilibrium constant times R 
times the temperature in kelvins raised to the power of all the coefficients here. This is one, but we call it zero because it's a solid. This is one, this is one, this is one. And all together, we get a Kp of 2.7. Okay, now that we have our equilibrium constant, we can go ahead and use our ice table, which is our default method for finding equilibrium concentrations or relating them to initial concentrations. So we have our reaction equation. Carbon is a solid, so we're not going to worry about its initial or final concentrations. But for every one quantity of our reactants that we lose, we get back exactly the same quantity of products. And so we start out with four atmospheres of H2O. We lose whatever amount reacts. So we have a total final concentration of four minus that change. And then our CO and H2, we didn't have any, but whatever amount of H2O reacts, we produce the same amount of CO and H2. And so we just get plus X concentration or plus X pressure for those values. So now we'll write down our equilibrium constant expression for pressure, just like we did for concentrations. And it has exactly the same form. These are just pressures now instead of concentrations. And we'll plug in the final equilibrium values since that's what's represented by our Kp expression. And we figured out that Kp was equal to 2.7. So now we just gotta solve for x. So we get two values for x. And note that if we plug this negative 4.9 value in up here, that would give us negative concentrations over on the right side. And we also don't really expect to generate more than four atmospheres of H2O gas since all of our starting reactant was this, and we didn't have anything on the right side. So this is the only value that makes sense, the positive 2.2. We can go ahead and plug that in to our equilibrium value. Four atmospheres minus a change of X, which is 2.2 atmospheres, gives us a final pressure for H2O of 1.8 atmospheres. And as usual, we can double check our results by plugging in the equilibrium pressures that we calculated. In this case, the equilibrium pressures for CO and H2O are just X, so they're going to be 2.2 atmospheres. So we plug in those pressures for CO and H2 and the one that we calculated for H2O into our expression, and we get 2.69, which is very reasonably close to 2.7. So that's a pretty strong confirmation that we calculated the correct equilibrium concentration of H2O.